Hello everyone and welcome to this special ETRISE webinar on foreign trade policy. Our main focus of the foreign trade policy 2015-2020 has been to support the manufacturing and services sector with trade facilitation and ease of business being its main planks. It was envisioned that this would help to boost Indian exports globally, but FTP is more than just about exports and it has a wide impact on a range of businesses, domestic or international. We have with us Mr. Mahavir Pradab Sharma, Chairman, Carpet Export Promotion Council, who will delve further into the FTP and uh, will tell us more about how it impacts businesses and more importantly, how you can benefit from it. Mr. Sharma. Um, thank you, Neha. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, April 1st, 2015, um, less than a year um, into business, this present government came up with a five-year uh, foreign trade policy. And the main focus of this foreign trade policy was not only to have um, long-term policies in place, but to constantly monitor the impact of it and to take Indian exports to higher levels. So the whole paradigm shift of the exporting community and the world community going into online and e-commerce and everything has to move faster than what it used to move. The core focus was to make everything online from application of IEC codes for or RCMC applications or um, documents of export or banking or, or transfer of funds, anything that needs to be done, any, uh, you know, benefit that the government wanted to impart to the exporter had to be online and GST was part of it and all these everything that you will see is now synchronized with each other and it's become very very seamless uh, I think potentially an exporter saves about seven to ten days from what it used to um, take on documentation filing photocopying faxing scanning to what everything is uploaded and everyone every government department can now see it and that was a core idea behind the foreign trade policy. There were some minor changes that we will go over um, in the next 15-20 minutes as to what those were, why they were there, and what is the impact of them as on date, and then we'll go back for the question answers. So as I said, everything online, whether it's the import export code, it was um, whether it's the licenses, whether it's the duty drawback, everything went online with everything. E Sanchit, which is the online uploading of all the documents with the customs or the DGFT or whoever department can want it to see, is in place now. And people can just upload the documents sitting in their office, and everyone can now, from their custom clearing broker to the bank, everyone can see that. And that's what um, that has happened. The the BRCs are now issued online, which is a bank realization certificate of payments have been received, partial payments. So everything, you don't have to now go to the bank, everything can be applied. Even all the documents for exports to the banking sector are now uploaded sitting in your office. You don't have to physically send the documents. Everything is now processed. The EDI system, the everything is electronic now. And that is what everything was put into place. They were all legalized by this policy that this is a valid document and this will work and that, that's what was created. Um, the many things that were added like in this, you know, slide, if you will see, there were chartered accountants, they were, they could approve their um, uh, paperwork sitting online in their offices. They did not have to rubber stamp or put, do anything, just their membership number and that was, that was done. Town of excellence, this this 750 crore plus, if there is a town that is exporting, those were given specific uh, tasks and they were, you know, labeled as town of excellence. Uh, quite a few towns have been since added. Now the benefits will trickle down to not only the exporters in those towns, but all the ancillary industries and help the domestic uh, market. I mean, I'd just like to say that 20% of the Indian GDP or the revenues come from exports uh, at five. 540 billion US dollars of exports this past year. I think India, India's impact on local employment, on local uh, you know, trade-offs between buying from smaller suppliers or giving work, job works outside, the impact is huge. It's far more than 20%. And that is why the government has always been very proactive towards 
uh, supporting uh, exports and promoting them and making them compete with the world levels. Uh, recently, um, there is a GI uh, uh, indications that have been added to the whole thing. Now, the GI is just not export centric, but it's still a G it is a strength of that area. And eventually, if there is a strength of printed fabric or a carpet or a dhari or or any other traditionally made thing the, the traditional crafts will get benefited the local weavers will get benefited and i'm sure in the next year when 2020 the new policy comes out the gi products or gi areas will also be earmarked and some benefits of some sorts to the weavers will be passed on so the government is very very long term very very proactive they're trying to work out because wto and its impact is looming very hard, which we'll talk a little later. But I think the government is putting things in place where they can support and make sure that India excels across the world, uh, whether it's free trade agreements or FTPs. It is making sure that India is poised to grow along with the entire world and exports go from 2-3% to 4-5% in the next 4 or 5 years. So that's, that's the main thing on the thing. The EPCG scheme, um, is also another scheme that was um, added um, in this, you know, the EPCG always existed, but they made it a little lenient. Instead of 100%, um, eight years of duty, uh, you know, the duty, eight times the duty that you save, recovered in foreign exchange by exports, they've made it 75% recovery, which means you can now sell 25% of your products to the domestic market, and that would still be considered as, um, you know, um, the EPCG, uh, commitment that you have made while you're saving duty. So the government has involved the DTA sector into the SEZ or the EOU or to the exporters and passed down the benefits through this so that the work and uh, the impact of foreign trade policy goes to the, so, I mean, I'm doing a lot of technical jargon, but I think we can clarify things on the question answers, but the EPCG scheme and the 25% waiver that we, that exporters could get Foreign duty-free imports is one one such thing that has um, that has happened. Um, this you know in the whole game of uh, the things, and this of obviously helps the Make in India program and this thing. The other two major things from various schemes that the government over the last 10, 15, over the previous 15 years had put in focus, special um, LSC countries had special incentives. Africa had is this government cleared all that out and they clubbed it under two very simple schemes, the MEIS and the SEIS. Basically, the manufacturing and the merchant traders were falling into the MEIS scheme and the, the service sector fell into the so software, travel, medical tourism, everything fell into the SEIS scheme. And this incent and the incentive for India to compete from anywhere from 3 4% to up to 7% now was the reason where the government could compensate the exporters so that they can compete with the world for all the overheads and expenses that they had to make. So these two, two schemes um, actually you know, created a lot of uh, impact on the whole thing um, in, in the terms of uh, promoting India and getting things in place rather than have multiple schemes and multiple checks and measures. So they did categorize countries into three different parts with developed countries and, and, and so on and so forth and increased rates uh, of help because the getting into smaller markets is always difficult and needed more support. And that's how they kind of balance the whole thing. But still, I, I personally feel that uh, clubbing the two sectors, making clear demarcation has helped an exporter plan long term and that's what what government um, did um, as and you can see on the slide the 75 percent of the normal ex, um, obligation on the epcg and we can go through details of epcg i have um, the whole scheme in front of me and if need be we can delve into it a little later again the government always wants the, the farm and the agriculture sector the defense the high tech um, sector to grow but they also were very very proactive in the smaller crafts the e-commerce, the goods being sent by the post office or the courier companies. So they made sure that you know 25,000 rupee shipment would also get a license, even if it was sent through um, the you know the post office or a courier company. So everything the government did was not only for large scale and mega companies, but also for the small artisans, for small um, exporters, merchant exporters, manufacturer exporters. It's it's really interesting 
how the government wanted to nurture small startups, early stage companies, people who've not risen beyond uh, the star status or not even close to being that. And that's what this, this shows their intent. And so these smaller, uh, up to 25,000 MEIS benefits, though cumbersome and though minuscule, but still the fact that it is there in principle means that you can have a small e-commerce company and sell small items of craft and still get the benefits of whatever bigger, larger exporter um, can be get. Then, then the government eased the import because the import and value add are very important for an exporter, whether it's um, uh, technology, whether it's uh, hardware, whether it's apparel, whether it's machinery. So all the EPCG scheme, the import duty, the entitlement of uh, deferment of duty, all these things the government tried to create online and that's what that's what they have done and they created a system where if you have a decent turnover in the last two years you were an export approved exporter your um, compliance was much lower the trust was on you you could just upload everything and there was no questions asked and things moved on at a very very brisk space and that's something that, that the government did very good the 100 percent eou and all these schemes you know were merged into one. There were some set of benefits that you would get under MEIS and SEIS. And if you were not availing the benefits of an EOU or other benefits, if you, so they, obviously there are checks and measures in every policy and the government had these uh, things in place that because there is benefits that you have um, no import duty, other benefits on as an 100% EOU, you were, you were not given the entire benefits of the M M e MES or the duty drawback. And that's what this, um, you know, slide um, shows the MS. As I said, the small uh, manufacturers, the Nirat Nirat Bandhu scheme for MSME exporters is very good. Small loans, low cost interest rates. Clusters have been identified. Um, the previous government identified 100 products and 100 districts were given those uh, products and extra money for skill upgradation to support local and small manufacturers and exporters was infused and those funds have come down and that is added to the Skill India um, thing and that's why I, I personally feel even before you become an exporter while you're making products you are uh, you, you have the option of not exporting and providing and selling to the domestic market but that influx of identification of the product and the city has helped grow um, the, the impact of uh, manufacturing sector and the services um, sector. The customs uh, uh, department, the DG, you know, they're all working 24 seven, the clearing, the new ports have been added where um, exports can happen. Everything doesn't have to go to Bombay and, uh, you know, Calcutta or Delhi or whatever now, even smaller ports in Kerala or Tamil Nadu or everything. So airports have become, you know, custom savvy. Everything doesn't have to go to the Delhi International Airport. So everything has moved from uh, ease of doing business, electronic, and that is what, it, and this is what I was talking about, the town of um, export excellence, um, the 70, 50 crores of exports with a particular town, that is a special status. The MEI scheme, which I will um, talk also em emphasizes on smaller um, towns and exports. The MEI scheme um, is another way that the government has been compensating and promoting and marketing um, export products. The MEI scheme comes from the Ministry of Commerce and it goes through organizations, export promotion councils, or um, uh, other um, exporting organizations which are, you know, kind of approved by the government of India. Funds are given to do to do buyer seller meets, to do reverse buyer seller meets, to do a road show, to brand and promote products outside, to open warehouses, um, joint warehouses for the community or a product specific warehouse in various countries. Um, translation of language, you know, Russia, China, um, you know, Europe, many countries, language issues are there. So all these are being subsidized and exporter or the exporter community through their um, uh, respective channels of uh, councils. This MAI scheme, you know, doles out lots, you know, thousands of crores through these councils, which are trickled down to the small, medium exporters to subsidize their um, exhibition overseas, which would otherwise cost them a lot of uh, money. And this, this MAI scheme, though in existence before, was more uh, made, the funds were increased, I think 25 to 30%, if I'm not wrong. Uh, additional funds were laid uh, year on year, and also the policies were made far more lenient and far more progressive and faster. And that is what we've seen in the last three to four years. As, as I was talking about, um, um, you know, at the role of imports into exports um, and uh, value add, um, especially in sectors like the gem and jewelry, 
um, uh, the software and uh, computer hardware sector. I think this is a very important thing where you can either have an advanced authorization if you are doing a 15% value add, or you can do a duty-free import authorization if you're doing a 20% value add. You know, either way, it's whatever suits you. The government has given you benefit where you can defer the payment and you can get your um, duty, the, the capital investment is reduced by way of putting in duty on most of the products, except barring some products or some listed products that are not included. And that's how the government has evolved or you know, benchmarked um, supporting the small and medium uh, importers and exporters, especially when they're re-exporting the merchandise. If you're beyond a certain um, turnover, there's advanced authorization of annual, you know, then you can get an advanced authorization annually because you all kind of know how much you will import and what you will export. And that is what these three elements of duty, either deferment or uh, potentially paying it later or by duty free import, in addition to what EPCG offers, were added for within the year without having to commit exports, just a value out of at least 15 to 20% is what was needed. And that's why government ins, you know, instituted these things, which was good for smaller exporters who necessarily don't want to go through the capital goods import of EPCG, and that's what it is. The interest equalization scheme, I mean, again, um, very important. Um, that this scheme, though it's been in existence before the FTP also, and it is very important, this Indian interest rates in India have always been very high compared to the, the world where it's 1%, 2%, 3%, a prime is 3 4%, and you could get money for 2 plus prime percent. And so we, we as exporters from India were paying high interest rates of 10, 11, 12%, and, or 9%. So the government, through many years, has always been doing this interest equalization scheme. It's currently, I think, at 3%, where whatever the ba ba so bank is subsidized, but rather than them penalizing um, public sector or private sector banks, the government pays 3% and the exporters has to, you know, get the 3% knockoff and he able to compete when it comes to pre-shipment or post-shipment funding. And that's what um, the interest equalization scheme is for people who want to avail uh, bank uh, uh, benefits for both pre and post-shipment uh, rupee, even, even for, um, I mean, for the foreign currency, you don't need the, uh, interest submission because the foreign currency is available at prime plus whatever um, the prevailing competitive rates are and that's what this is now this incentives chart in addition to whatever duty to um, to um, interest subvention to licenses to MEIS or CIS in the government has gone ahead and done many trade agreements its focus has been mostly in Asia. I think more or less every country other than Pakistan and China are covered um, with trade agreements with India where not only can they export, we, we can also export and the duty is exempted or very minimalistic and also South America. So Latin American countries, Chile, Paraguay, Argentina, or some other countries. So India's, been, India's focus has been Latin America and the aids of Afghanistan, uh, Korea, Vietnam, Thailand, Japan, everyone, all these countries, um, and even now with Mauritius and some sort of Africa in Africa and a little bit of Southeast um, Asia and Asia Pacific with Australia and New Zealand. So the government, I think Finland is the only exception where the government has just in the last few months um, added um, a free trade agreement, um, and that's great. But more or less, this is what is in place, though I know for a fact that the government is continuously working um, through the MEA through the Ministry of Commerce and trying to get as much as uh, uh, free trade agreements, GSP benefits with the US and other agreements with the EU. So the, the negotiations are on, it's not been frozen with the government, it's on the radar where the government wants to open up India for import at low duty products that these countries make, but also enhance or let us enter through these countries with you know, various uh, schemes that they, they might have to um, give. And that's what um, I think um, India has done. So the government is working from small, medium, skill, craft, to duty, to not letting your capital block, everything online to reduce corruption, uh, more or less, and also trade agreements with you know, countries so that we can compete with countries that are you know, close by, where we have a distance with some places. So I think all this in a nutshell has put India on a roadmap um, to where we can grow. And I, I personally feel we might not have uh, reached where we have reached because these policies and these processes 
take time uh, for it to seep in, to become part of the system, for the exporters to take benefit of. Um, GST got um, involved in between, and now everything um, from GST refunds on exports um, to um, RC, the registration and membership certificate, which is now online, everything is now moved away from paper and everything is now in place for the government to now just add more. Um, trade agreements across the world to provide more money for marketing and branding and showcasing Indian products at, at exhibitions and buyer seller meets overseas. Make sure that more and more countries and ease of um, you know arrival into ease, into India with visa business visas being given out very quickly for most of the importing countries. Those kinds of policies with the MEA and and the Ministry of uh, support of Ministry of Commerce I think are needed and I think India. The growth will be far more exponential in the next five years, in my opinion, and that's where we are at right now. So, I mean, I hope this made sense and this made, uh, I could cover everything broadly. We can go into details if, if there are question answers and we can we can move from there. Uh, right. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, so, we have uh, a lot of questions that have started coming in now. Uh, we'll take up the first one. Uh, so, Satyam Gupta asks, tell me how do starters with small businesses, or maybe he means that how do startups, mm -hmm. uh, how can they benefit from the STP? See, I mean, the, if you can combine the startup policy with the FTP, I think the, the uh, impact or the uh, whole uh, monetization of the government scheme and policies can be adopted. I mean, for 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 case in point, if you register your startup as a startup, and if you're in tech, there's no income tax for three years. There is no you know questions. The, the angel tax, which was looming on all of us, and now that that's been you know you know quite a few lenient things have happened. So I think as a startup, there are quite a few benefits. Similarly, once you have the IAC code. Um, in place, you can actually start to um, uh, start selling online. You don't have to physically showcase. You don't have to travel. The overheads have come uh, become so easy. Where um, e-commerce through uh, portals has become easier. So I think as a startup, if you combine the FTP, the duty drawback, the interest subvention, the for the this thing, the startup policy benefits where you can get a lot of. Uh, uh, benefits as this early stage startup so long as your turnover is below a certain level you know so long as you follow and i'm sure as a startup you will be under that category and if you have identified the right product and if you've identified the right uh, place to export it from you don't have to be in a delhi or a bombay you can be sitting anywhere and doing business on your computer right right uh, so Nalini Konero writes that uh, how does it affect the current uh, us FTP? So we don't actually have a, a you know, of FTP with the U.S. U.S. has been dominating um, the and U.S. and India kind of not at loggerheads, but always have been, um, in a, you know, in a situation where like the current president is not happy with how India levies duties on so many things. Um, there was a, a GSP which was a made in India origin. Thing that existed with the US has now stopped. Those benefits, which was duty, was almost negligible, have now uh, impacted quite a few products from India, and the duty is now anywhere from three to six percent, from where it was 0 0.06 or 0 0.05 percent. So the the US is trying to get its stuff into India. India, everyone knows, is a big market. It's it's the you know largest um, consumer telecom IT market and it's growing as we go so the us really looks into india as a real market so there's no trade policy in place there have been uh, things that have been put or removed the ftp does not kind of impact the us in uh, other than the fact that as an exporter you're benefiting but that is that benefit would be for china also so the us so it's, it's not a country centric uh, policy. It's uh, FTP is an FTP for an exporter for people who want to export. Um, it's not US centric. Okay, so uh, the next question is from Deepika Garg, who says, please suggest a short duration certification course on foreign trade policies that can be undertaken by chartered accountants who wish to make a career in this field. So, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, there's only one institute that I think I've seen graduates from an IIFP. 
um, has an online certificate course. Um, and it's basic, you know, from basic certificate courses to deep down courses. I think II Indian Institute of Foreign um, Trade has um, branches across India. You can do it online. And I think if, if, if you want to have a small short term uh, certificate course or a diploma or a degree, I think they're able to provide all of that. And there's a not only not only just because, um, you know, you want to become an exporter, even if, as a career. Um, in all export, start export houses or export houses in the export uh, domain. If you're looking for a job, um, doing a quick course from IIFT is something that I strongly recommend. Okay. And uh, then there is another one that is coming from Ganpati Puri. Uh, he asks, I would like to understand the role of India in the world foreign policies and how India is changing its policies to benefit homegrown organizations. So I kind of covered that. I think India is signing um, uh, free trade agreements uh, and, and uh, you know, CPAs and stuff with various countries. And I, tr I think India, uh, with the current government, has ma made a huge impact um, on the world market with the, not only um, its large economy and a consumer market, but also um, producing and exporting quality products. The Indian standards of environment compliance, social compliances, quality checks on products is improving every single day. And I think Indian products um, are, with a Made in India label, are now a matter of pride and quite a few brand names, whether it's apparel or jewelry or engineering goods, um, India has uh, created a, a good space for itself. And I think, uh, um, India will grow. Uh, we just need to look inwards and not take shortcuts and, and continue to follow follow or through environment, social and quality um, checks so that we, we don't um, bear the brunt of negative publicity that might come out of um, this. And that's that's a core to India's strength and all of us, small, medium, large, um, all of us have a role to play. And I think we should very seriously take this very seriously. All right. Um... There is uh, Nitin Pawar who asks, what factors should we consider while importing or ordering online through app or web? Uh, what are the possible hidden charges uh, or duties, or is there any checklist that we can refer to? So the, the duty, of course, there is a duty um, um, beyond a certain point and which varies from product to product. What you need to check is the HS code of the product if you if it's like a single or a small item it doesn't really matter but if it's going to be a huge quantity on a regular basis you really need to um, see the hs code and see what the import duty is some some to protect the domestic market the indian government does levy higher um, rates of um, duty on certain products and you have to be very very um, careful and everything is available on the uh, i think cb uh, the customs uh, website and or maybe also on the dgft website and it's it's available and that's the only thing that's chargeable other than clearing and forwarding charges which your courier company or your um, clearing agent might be able to tell you what the charges will be okay so uh, the next question has come uh, come up on the e-commerce sector so Raghu Mahajan asks that uh, how does FTP really play out in the e-commerce space and uh, what is its increasing growth and impact on B2B exports in coming years FTP plays a very important role as I said even if it's a 25,000 rupee um, export um, of a product or service from India I think um, FTP and the benefits of the service or the, um, or the manufacturing sector of licenses of interest or pre-shipment, post-shipment, um, of uh, getting clearances and payments through banks is all the same. It doesn't, the, the FTP does not differentiate between, except for extra benefits that one, two, three, four, five star exporters get. Otherwise, everyone below below a three million US dollar annual export is all the same, whether it's e-commerce or non-e-commerce. And eventually, B2B um, exports Online B2B exports um, is the future. The world is shrinking. The middlemen are, are being eliminated. And I think I can vouch, uh, I'm not sure about, uh, um, you know, I think probably for services also and products, people are getting to the source. It will, the future lies in getting to the source and buying, procuring and sending it online with minimal expenses rather than have huge real estate um, surround you. Okay, I think there's the next question, which would also be very topical and relevant, is uh, on the GST refund impact. 
on uh, export and working capital crunch solutions. This has been asked by Anu Jagannath. So GST um, is, exports are zero GST. Um, that that's something that the finance minister has said on day one. Um, the process initially was a little cumbersome. It took some time for it to settle. The refunds were not happening for the first nine months, but there were you know monthly uh, camps that the uh, finance ministry or the revenue department ministry took over, and they impacted and created uh, huge um, you know refunds came about in April. Um, last year in 2018, after having had the GST, now it's become seamless. I mean, if you have put, if you filed your returns on time, GST, R3, B, and everything, if your shipping bill is filed by your shipping agent on time, the GST refunds happens in three, four days, and and it's it's become very, very seamless. If for any reason your refunds are stuck, the councils or other uh, associations that you're members of can help you uh, sort it out. It's something that's a process issue. It's not a human issue at all when it comes to um, uh, refunds, which are showing on your, um, the GST portal are credited to you. If you are exporting on the LUT route, and I, I assume Anuj that uh, you would understand what LUT is, where you've given an undertaking and you are not doing a export and you are then seeking a refund on what you have paid, that you have to go to your local um, uh, GST or customs office and file for refund and then refund. There is some paperwork required in that at this point, which I, I personally feel should be will be done away sooner but i think as of now that's the little bottleneck if you're doing exports to lut i would strongly recommend using lut and non-lut exports to make sure that everything that's on your portal credited on your gst the refund comes and it's the balance gets deducted automatically is the route that you should take okay um next we have a question which has come in from uh, uh, vikram singh uh, what has India's uh, FTP planned for small scale industries? I kind of answered that with the um, export excellence, um, you know, cities with the GI. Now I think the government will take cognizance of um, all the small and micro industries and in, based out of tier three or tier four cities will can get benefits. Um, getting mudra loans, um, the the Funding is easy, and I think that's uh, and collateral free loans uh, for up to 50 lakhs. All these things are in place. The banking sector is going through a turbulent time because of some big ticket uh, things. And I think the banking sector reforms are the next thing that the new government um, should take up because that that is something that is creating a bottleneck for micro, small, and even larger exporters. And I think that's um, that's something that I would wish or want the government to take up very the very first thing as soon as they come into uh, power. Okay, next uh, we take up uh, what uh, Lakshman V writes that will the import duty exemption scheme support incentives and subsidies continue? Please com comment. Um, well, actually, in theoretically, they will not. Um, the WTO requires, and India has to be WTO compliant, though the Indian government is fighting at, at the highest um, level and trying to see how long they can prolong um, this thing. Our, our GDP um, are, are um, you know, from being a developing nation to a developed nation, we're on the threshold of that. So the WTO will be applicable and we will have to stop intensive incentivizing um, uh, things like the MEIS, and the SEIS, and they will definitely go. Duty drawback will not go because duty drawback is allowed under WTO. The duty drawback is basically for the import duties that you've paid for products that you might have bought locally, but your sector has paid, which are then equally divided, divided amongst exports. So those duty drawbacks will not go at the end. Licenses of the MEIS and SEIS and others will go. The, uh, but the government is still not paying us something that we are you know, if you really technically call us um, zero tax 
benefits they are not still coming to us there's something this rosl which is rebate on state levies the, the taxes or the duties that we are paying on petrol diesel electricity on lease deed stamp deed monday tax which is which all exporters directly or indirectly pay that money is not coming to us and i have a, i have a you know kind of pretty sure that the government will once the awto comes into place and the licenses uh, go away on the meis and the seis uh, scheme then i think the government will across the board start giving us these state levies which we are being charged which are not being refunded uh, because we are paying all these duties and cesses across various states which vary from state to state but the government i'm sure will sooner or later have to bring petrol diesel into gst and again harmonize one nation one tax and create an impact where the benefits can be similar across the, the globe rather than have a different benefit from Rajasthan to Haryana or to UP or to Tamil Nadu or whatever. Okay. Uh, the next, uh, you know, the next question is coming from Aniket the Mahajan, who asks, has there been enough ease of business for startups and finance support from the government? Uh, yes and no. Um, there is ease. Um, things are online, things are pretty much visible and you, you can do stuff much faster. Something that used to take a week, 10 days or two weeks now takes a matter of day or two or three days. And I think everything is everything is now available online and you can download it, download and take a print out the physical hard copy syndrome that India had and uh, scanning, etc. has reduced pretty much. So I think it's become easier. Uh, funding, not that easy. Um, as I said earlier, the banking sector um, has become very, very, um, you know, very of uh, taking uh, risks. Um, they're not uh, giving um, loans that easily. The processes are taking, their diligence is taking longer. Um, they don't, no one wants NPAs, no one wants uh, bad debts. And because they have suffered in the last two, three years uh, due to small, medium, agriculture loans and also larger um, you know loans running in the thousands of crores they have now kind of um, started to uh, punish the small and medium and the middle people uh, small medium manufacturers and there is a crunch on liquidity um, on the export sector and as i said the, the government should look into something like this especially for startups if they don't get funding from angels or ventures i think it's very important that the financial institutions should um, support them, whether it's debt converted to equity, even for those companies, or the other checks and measures that can be in place. I think that's what is needed. Okay. Um, then we have something from uh, Sagar Burma, who's asking that is there an impact on international contracting practices with respect to changes in foreign trade? Um, not really. Your international contracting, um, again, I'll split it into two trade agreements in place, non-trade agreements in place. Basically, depending on those things in place, um, they will not change. Um, whether um, you um, sign up and um, or open an office, uh, double taxation avoidance you know, treaties are in place. I, I don't think there is anything that will change because of the FTP. FTP basically subsidizes or intense incentivizes is what you need to get because you've paid somewhere and you need to get that back in some way or the form and so that you can become compliant and competitive with the world. I don't think world agreements and contracts should change because of that. Okay. Um, there's another question that is coming from Nilesh Sharma who he asked about the about the importer exporter code. He said that merely because a person has no importer exporter code at the time of rendition of service, will he be will it dis entitle him to claim the SEIC benefit? No, you have to have the so you know the everyone across the world has some sort of whether there's a tax ID, whether it's a uh, bank card, whether it's an importer exporter code, a company that is exporting is governed by the IAC. You know, previously there used to be two uh, uh, 
numbers now they've just brought it down to one number so i think having that is mandatory that is basically registering with the reserve bank of india that you're now authorized to go to an authorized dealer and deal in foreign exchange because all export so you have to understand seis and meis will not come to you if you don't get foreign exchange if you're getting rupees you will not get that money um, if it's deemed export you will not get that um, license so you have to get foreign currency for you to get foreign currency and to be governed by the fact that you've exported x amount of services and you've received x amount of payment and the value of that x item is what it should be that's why you should get a percentage off of that as a refund is monitored through the iic code so the iic code is is absolutely mandatory for you to get that in, but rightfully so because otherwise how would you label someone uh, because you know a proprietorship can be similar names and similar names everywhere yeah, i think here's the dilemma is that we say that the intent is to promote exports for the country which can happen without iec also no iec is required i mean so how, how will who will judge whether your service is worth a hundred dollars or a hundred thousand dollars i mean I, if i were to give uh, a one hour of advice i can give it for free or i can build the company sitting in the us and i'm doing it on skype or whatever and i can say this is my service charge and here's a thousand dollar bill now who if that thousand dollars has to come to me you know as one off it's okay but if it's on a regular basis it has to be monitored that i'm not transferring money without actually selling any product or service so you have to understand that the government has to regulate um, money that's going in and coming out and similarly you would have to pay commissions uh, to to buying agents to you know middlemen across the world there has to be some sort of governance in place and that's where IEC is required and it's a two to three day job. It's it's everything is online. You don't even have to go anywhere. You can just apply for the IEC sitting home at, at your home with just a bank account in place. Okay. okay. Um, next, we have uh, something from Somerset Mondal. Uh, how can small scale and emerging knowledge advisory firms benefit from these policies? Um, knowledge advisory is basically falls into a service um, sector export, I think. It's very simple. I mean, you can sell your services. You can sell your time. The example that I just gave. I think you you can and you're your own master. I mean, everyone. I mean, uh, you know, like a lawyer, like a, a consultant, like a whatever you might want to call yourselves. You can actually build people in foreign currency and be paid for it through bank transfers and have get benefits that um, the government has to offer i think it's it's beneficial beneficial more than in more than one ways and it's 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 better that you do that okay um, next we have uh, a question from anil grover who's who writes what more services should be encouraged to inverse the balance of trade I think the balance of trade is a serious challenge for um, the government of India, uh, especially with um, uh, defense, um, oil, um, and other, um, you know, software, uh, in quite a few other sectors. And I think that's a challenge. I think India's strength um, lies lies in the service sector. I think the service sector is, I think, at 200, 205 billion US dollars. I think if we can potentially use our um, you know, and we, we are a very well educated, technically qualified uh, young country. I think the services sector needs to grow at, a, at an exponential rate um, for us to drive off balance of payment because you know manufacturing takes time, it takes resources, um, it takes uh, physical uh, space much more than what a service sector requires, and and it's the, the you know the quantum of exports is still proportional to the um product that is being produced in india which is not very very much whether it's through um you know mining or agriculture or whatever so i think the service sector from 200 to 5 billion needs to go to about a thousand billion and that's the future that indian government or india should look into um, as a prospect of uh, writing off the balance of uh, you know like what japan did with technology many many decades ago i think india needs to do the service sector um, Anand Kuel asks, what, what is the scope for foreign trade in education business? So, education business. So, I, I also, so if you, I don't know, if you're talking about teaching kids the foreign FTP and the foreign trade and the documentation that the banks are needed or how to sell in various countries, 
there are institutes in place. You can have open more institutes across cities that they, it doesn't exist. The future lies in all that is required, but there will be short term courses, maximum one year. And there is money, but that's not in. But if you're talking about having schools and colleges where foreign students can come and study, an education sector uh, or online education sector that India has qualified teachers and create online courses for people sitting in, in third world countries in Africa and, and doing courses, whether in medicine or engineering or uh, MBAs or BBA or, or whatever. I think that also is a very important sector. I think so far the government is only looking at tourism um, and travel, um, religious uh, tourism, medical tourism. I think government needs to look at education also because India has great institutions. India has the infrastructure, uh, both offline and online. And I think it has a great potential and that could be a service sector of growth in the future uh, because English um, by far is, is a language that we use and is required to be known across the world uh, for people to give us, uh, I mean, like, why can't we be Singapore or Australia or the US and UK rather than our students going across, we should get students coming in from Africa and Asia um, or other Afghanistan and other countries that, that need to, uh, um, you can't afford to go to UK, US and Australia as of the world. Right. Uh, so the next question is coming from uh, KPS Suresh. He says, is soft has software export been properly verified, checked, and acknowledged by any government party? How can I do a personal, individual export of anything like that? See, it is verified. Um, there is, um, if it's if you're a small exporter, there's STPI um, in in place. There is, um, there are special cells um, uh, with the customs department. There's one in Noida, I know, in around Delhi, which which you have to kind of tell them that you were exporting a software and that's worth that much. You you might have to justify the price at times um, and uh, whatever, but generally they're very easy. It's all online again. It's not very complicated, but there is a verifying authority. Uh, getting an import export code is required. I think that's what you need. And even if you start selling your services and whether it's web related services or creating websites and charging foreign entities, it's small as, as small as that. Um, they they do need to be verified. The prices have to be listed. The billing has to happen, and it's it's very simple. It's seamless. It doesn't have to be physically verified. No one will come to your place. And I, as a web designer or a web developer, can charge a thousand dollars for a website. And you, if you are good, and you can charge ten thousand dollars, and you are being paid. You have to show orders from the customers. You have to show the legit website that once it's ready. You have to show that you're doing an AMC for the website. So little little things are billable, are paid, and it's doable. Just get an import export code, and the local customs or the bank, your local bank will tell you where where should it go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next, we are getting in some we are getting something from Adamya Sharma who asks, what are the exporter what what kind of exporter benefit schemes are one can avail of uh, from the government? I've listed out all the, the schemes. Um, they're all, all visible online. I mean, we can discuss it offline. Uh, duty deferment, duty. Uh, you know, EPCG to duty drawback, to interest subvention, to MEIS, CCIS, all these are schemes that are, are beneficial. MAI would come through your uh, Export Promotion Council or the organization that you are a member of. And I think that's those are the kind of schemes that the government has in place that I, in the initial 15, 20 minutes, uh, said they can be used and they're beneficial. Um, then, uh... Nimesh Patel writes that I am interested in understanding the FTP, which will help in maximizing profits as we are a software exporting company. Uh, please tell us how we can go about. I mean, I, I, basically the, the SEIS is where um, you, you would be benefited. Um, you have to register with your local, uh, you know, area customs office, and that's where you can start to export um, softwares and um, everything has to happen through the bank. Your import export code should be in place. I think it's currently at uh, um, 7%. There is another thing that is um, the, the software exports get is called what is called an LOA, uh, which is a letter of allotment, which entitles you to a duty-free import uh, of services or products um, 
spread over five years so long as your exports are much more than what you're importing i think that that if you are an scz are applicable and you are reporting to your local um you know customs office and the bonded so loa happens in the scz if you're outside the scz then the seis will will impact and you can you can work on it all right uh Prakash Rajendra wants to know that what is the possibility of further extension of merchandise exports in India scheme and how long it may come to be? <sighs> that is your guess is as good as mine. I, I think I thought this was going to die December 2018, but it's continuing. Um, the Indian government has been forceful enough um, to fight off um, countries um, like the US on the WTO uh, platform because in, in our opinion, in the government's opinion and in my opinion also, I think US um, and China are highly subsidizing their exporters, especially the farm and the agriculture sector, especially the um, airplane um, sector, uh, you know, the Boeings and the Airbuses. So I think India needs to fight for its own uh, product specific strengths and uh, continue to do that. It can go on for another six months. I mean, we will get a six month warning. The government will have to change gears. But I think as of now, not before, until December 2019, God willing, even longer. But don't don't be out of any fear that if MEIS ceases to exist, there will not be any other way that the government will be able to help us. There are ways and means which the government is already aware of and are in place already. Okay, there's another question that is coming in from Sumant Shah. He wants to know that I want to that he wants to start an export business, and he's searching a solution for setting up business legal aspects and scope of different products in uh, you know particularly for big business so what do you how he's asking you for suggestions on something like that i mean i think the first thing that i i feel that you should or one should do is to uh, identify the product or service um the location have the right manpower or the technical know-how to make that product in a competitive uh, this thing um the easiest thing is to create a portal a, a website and and um you know uh, out of it and then obviously compliance issues where you know the IAC code opening of a bank account uh, knowing how what what the documents have to say um, and then starting to promote your product or service online or offline is required i think it's it's a it's a process uh, but it all starts um, at the core in identifying um, the product or service and the, the key people that have the strength to make that competitively not only something that can compete ac across other countries but something that can compete within the country uh, with other people who can, could be doing similar stuff so you the, the identification is the bigger challenge uh, processes and paperwork is hardly a challenge these days okay so uh, another question that is wants to know that how does the foreign trade policy affect the business in expansion and market capturing? I think it, it helps a lot. I, I personally feel that, um, you know, uh, the, the whole idea of um, so getting support on interest, duty, um, licenses to import or to be able to trade that license for cash uh, from other exporters, and then also identifying or getting markets identified and showcasing products across the world um, offline at subsidized rates is a huge incentive. And I think that helps uh, one grow um, gradually. And I think that's what one should uh, be looking at. And I think the government will continue to uh, support uh, exporters in one way or the other. Um, okay. Sajun, Sajun Raj Santosh wants to know that what are the export benefits for electronic products same i mean electronic products like any hardware um, will be entitled for meis um, schemes for all the schemes that i said epcg value add, duty drawback you know due to deferment whatever is applicable to non-engineering goods is applicable to engineering goods i mean there are very few items that are under the you know protective um scheme of things. Otherwise, more or less, everything is the same things are applicable everywhere. Uh, okay, then uh, Mayank Singh wants to know that what is the strategy of Indian corporates to showcase themselves as strong players in global corporations? See, Indian corporates and, you know, mega sized companies, um, um, obviously, um, just everything, the scale is different. 
uh, while a small guy identifies the products and his strengths, they identify the product and strength of our country or the product they can make or the technology that they can import and combine. So the, this, this heart lies in creating um, something that's absolutely world-class and competitive to other countries that could possibly be able to make that and putting the manpower in place, the machinery in place, technology in place and also creating something that's that's you know compliant with with world standards of quality environment and social once they have done that then the growth of those companies whether opening up offices across um, the world or creating a hub and spoke model and opening five offices in five continents and then supplying to smaller because see the challenge is also logistics uh, when it comes to many products uh, not as much for services but but let's say there's a cement company which is which is india's number one and they want to now go into africa they now want to go into russia they now want to compete with china and go to uh, you know Vietnam or, or South and North Korea, you have, you have to understand that supplying from a plant in, in Tamil Nadu or in, in Madhya Pradesh to Africa is time consuming, cumbersome and not cost effective. So you will have to create many plants or mini go-downs or warehouses in let's say Africa, identify a country and then create a hub and spoke model and redistribute it or in Europe or, or wherever. So the, the countries have to do that. Then they have, there has to be partnerships, there has to be uh, collaborations. You know, unless you go into countries with local knowledge of the market, local domain expertise, local legal knowledge, local compliance issues, um, optimizing on the trade agreement between the two countries, optimizing on the taxations and tariffs, you do need to have local partners and local employees in place. And that's where the Indian companies should focus. And then last but not the least, marketing is a very important tool. When you're equal on everything else, it's the branding of your product that's, that's very important. And I think India or the Indian corporates need to market and brand something uh, made in India or technologies from India and create a, a, a niche in the world market where it says that if it's coming from India, the product is generally um, high class or, or, or better than everything else or equal to everyone else. And then, of course, price is something that that can be worked upon. And I think we, we are good at all that and we can compete the world. Right, there's another question which uh, has been asked uh, again from an educational point of view by Akshay Kumar. Mm -hmm. And uh, he asked that he would like to know if there is online certification in exports that uh, is available. Yeah, so IIFT I think has online courses, as, as I said earlier, um, there is, um, other smaller institutions across the India that are open, but I think best, best and the most easiest thing is to work um, in an export house, work under an exporter as an apprentice, as as a uh, learner, because nothing beats practical training. I mean, you can learn all the theories in the world, but you really have to understand because it's not just how to do the paperwork or how to uh, take advantage of government policies. It's also how to make your product competitive, how to evolve and pivot and create newer markets for yourself, how to compete with your own, within your own country, outside your own country, and also minimize your overheads so that you can compete and grow and be, you know, profitable. So all these things are a combined effort and no institute or no college or no exporter can teach that. It's something that you will have to learn as the time goes. Once you know your strengths, I think that that's where you can leverage and grow from one to the other. Uh, right. Uh, Sakshi wants to know about the midterm review uh, policy that FTP had focused on um, uh, labor intensive MSME sector. So, how much uh, did that, uh, how much has that benefit really translated uh, you know, into reality for the MSME sector? So, the, 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 the cities of export excellence and um, the Yojana where smaller loans are being given, Eid Mudra loans is an outcome of that midterm review. Um, and it has impacted, but not to a large extent in my personal opinion. I think a lot needs to be done. I think um, the government has uh, put things in place, but still they are not uh, totally uh, seeped into the roots of the Indian uh, micro um, manufacturing and services sector. The impact is not huge. I think we need to look at that and review that and not let money go waste. 
Um, uh, and the other thing that the, F, the midterm review did, which I don't think she's asked, but the, the implementation of GST and making GST uh, totally embedded into the whole scheme of things, that has been uh, achieved and that is working seamlessly and that's something the midterm review also did when it did come out in 2017. Okay, we'll take one more question. Um, this has come in from uh, Adya Kapoor. Uh, she asked how entrepreneur friendly is the foreign trade policy and um, do you think it helps their cause enough? <laughs> this never this word enough um, is a challenge. I don't think anything have, helps anything enough if you're not uh, you know focused and in, in control of yourselves. It does incentivize. It's a small, it's just a catalyst. It's not something that you can base your uh, product or service exports onto. They don't depend on these incentives and policies because they are subject to change, can go up and down, and everyone else like, along with you are, are getting it. So you're not the only one. The focus should be on your product, your abilities, and your service rather than on depending on this. This is just a catalyst to get you going. And that's what it should be treated at. Okay, I think we've completely run out of time, but there are many more questions that are coming in but uh, due to lack of time we won't be able to take those i think the questions with a subject like ftp there are always variety of questions because of the very nature of the subject yeah but uh, thank you so much mr uh, mr Mahavir sharma for joining us and giving us such insightful takeaways thanks a lot pleasure being here thank you